So uh, thanks again, everybody. My apologies for a little bit of a technical difficulty there. I am thrilled to be here again. Again, as uh, Enrique had mentioned, had an opportunity to chat in 2017, also in 2018. I'm trying to harness my inner Dr. Braveheart from Jumanji. Uh, again, when I heard Jurassic Park, that was uh, the first thing that I thought about. Um, today's going to be a fun conversation. It's one that over the last few years I've been thinking a lot about and in some of my prior roles, this has been one of the big challenges that I've needed to architect and been able to build pieces of. Um, but really, when I was looking at what was the opportunity in the marketplace, and I started to understand some of the capabilities that Blunk had, um, but maybe was not yet well known, um, really got me excited and interested in how I could contribute to Splunk in that that space. So that's what we're gonna be looking at today. Again, this may be opening your eyes to things, um, I'm also going to be doing a live, well, it's a demo that I created. Um, you'll see why. Um, I actually go through about six different tools fairly quickly in about nine minutes. But how do we aggregate and correlate all of this information? Again, the things that we've seen so far, uh, really talking about these point solutions, collecting all of this data, and then thinking about automating our pipeline for ultimately what our customers need. Speed, quality, and low cost. And we need a proven and innovative practice to do this. So a brief agenda, uh, we'll talk about a product vision. So this may be if you're at a midsize or an enterprise organization and you're creating a product as a service, uh, what might that product vision look like? We'll spend a little bit of time on the problem itself. I'll talk you through a journey that you may be on and some things to think about along the way. Then visualize what this could look like for you, some of the solutions that I've seen through my journeys. Um, and then we'll do the nine minute or so demo, popping through five or six different um, capabilities and enable you to see how this all works together end to end. Um, and then lastly, just talk about um, a bit more of a journey that you might want to take and investigating and looking around at some key links that uh, I've got in there for you. So starting with a journey, ending with a journey, felt appropriate for Jurassic Pack. Um, so without further ado, uh, again, as we think about this possible product vision, uh, again, I didn't want to kind of say this is it and everything that you should be thinking about, but here's an option. Um, this is something that I've picked up along the way. Um, as you can see, I've got a citation down here for this format to scrum.org. Um, so again, nothing that I came up with, but um, all of this content is something that I authored. Um, but again, for your company, who needs telemetry insights, detection, diagnose, predict capabilities. Again, you can keep reading through this. This may or may not be relevant for your organization today, but it's something that I wanted to share and provide to you as something that may be a launching point. And again, as you're defining this service that you're providing um, from a overall, um, how do we get from the beginning to the end through our development pipeline with all the data, all these different solutions that we have, but we really need to be able to get to results. So as we think about that problem, um, I've got two visualizations here that I wanted to spend a little time on. So the top one is the CICD pipeline. Again, this is a very generic um, example. I know all of the folks participating today, you guys probably know this inside and out as well. So I'm not gonna spend too much time, but at some point you've got some code that's happening, it's committed, there may be some other related code in libraries, We've got builds kicking off, we're running unit tests, variety of different types of integration tests. Um, and again, you may also trigger some post build things like automated performance, security, functional, and these would be very quick regressions that would take five, seven, eight minutes to run um, to be able to kind of do a quick smoke test and give you those results against that specific build so that you know this is the quality of that build. Um, and then as you think through that continuous delivery model, Again, you're probably popping through a variety of different pre-prod environments to ultimately get into production. And at the bottom, so all of this data here, the data that gets created from that process, you can kind of follow along here left to right. And I know that you can very much relate to all of these pieces. And as you think about how is it that you're collecting logs, metrics, traces, and events today, there's probably a variety of different tools. And again, that's why I call these these kind of data collectors is they all become these stovepiped systems and data sources that are existing there. Think about all the different applications. These are running on a variety of platforms, variety of shared services, variety of infrastructures. 
especially in the multi-cloud environments that we're all using today. Um, service discovery, service registry. Again, how is it you're defining the services? How long do they survive? What are the relationships and dependencies of them? Um, again, reference data, thinking about logs, thinking about operational data. This is where things like APM comes in. So again, what are the different uh, processes that your users are going through? How is that performing, whether it's the application or the infrastructure that it's underlying and operating on top of? Um, so again, that's just this one collection bucket. So I think, you know, as I think about collection and as we move into, you know, the rest of these pieces, like ingestion. So again, I want to publish all the telemetry out of all of these variety of data collectors that you have. And again, this may be tens or it may be hundreds of different data collectors. But how is it that we then do the aggregation and correlation of all of these varieties of data pieces? And that's where things like publishing the telemetry, and you can see some of the different buzzwordy type things that are in here, but we want to stream telemetry, want to export these different services, and again, understanding this service discovery, service registry. Um, we probably have some sort of a telemetry bus set up, and of course, we want to introduce some sort of scanning and routing as it would relate to our security, risk, compliance, all of those types of um, items so that those are accounted for, again, with our ingestion. Um, things like PII data might come to mind uh, for many of you, especially in this financial asaurus area. Um, as we look at storage, so again, how is it we're storing this data? We know that we're gonna have metrics. We know that we're gonna have logs. We know that we're gonna have some sort of traces. We're gonna have the historical look back for however that long we need to have. The knowledge graph, again, this is an area to spend a lot of time in. There's a variety of ways um, that you can look at this from a knowledge graph, but this is really where you know the capabilities that you may not be able to stitch together, uh, this and this and that are all happening together to identify an issue that again, you would have otherwise not been able to see. So again, thinking about that knowledge graph uh, is very important. Um, as we keep moving through, how is it we're doing the processing? So again, this is where we're starting to get into some of the aggregation, some of the correlation, and you can see the telemetry processing time. Uh, I'm sorry, telemetry processing. We've also got the time series analysis that we want to run in parallel to correlation of the data, a correlation of, you know, APM results. Maybe we got some RUM data that's in there. Again, how does that data correlate into the variety of the different infrastructure that we have? How does that work with all the traces that we have? So again, you can start to see some of those pieces in processing and why they're critical and important and how this model can help you with having that conversation and thinking about how you get this done. Then we wanna build in some decision-making. We also wanna build in some learning. Um, ultimately, all this drives towards action. Again, why is it that we have a CI-CD pipeline gathering all of this type of data ultimately is to have some different types of actions that we can take. We've seen a variety of different types of dashboards um, all through um, this uh, Neotis pack today. And um, again, it's great to have dashboards. I I'm kind of done and over with the whole idea of having a dashboard to look at. Again, it is important for a number of folks to be able to see and look at and very quickly click into some of the details of which we're gonna have here. And again, that being critically important. Um, but what if we could really focus on how is it we can do more from a notification perspective? So that's where we get into alerts management. Automation is another huge topic. Again, you think about, um, again, at the end of it, when you get into all the orchestration automation, run book automation, these are massive areas of huge savings as it would relate to thinking about time, thinking about results. Again, whether you measure things in MTTD, MTTR, MTTI, again, a lot of information there to look at. The exploration, discovery, and analytics, and then ultimately we talk about problem configuration and capacity management. All of these being major areas that we wanted to highlight on this type of a model so that you can think about these pieces. So that kind of sets the groundwork and the vision for what is that problem? Because today I'm going to guess that you're probably all the way on the left-hand side with all these different collectors of data and really trying to figure out the ingestion piece, the storage piece, the processing piece, and the action piece um, to be able to leverage those collectors. So that's what I wanted to quickly talk about. Um, I also want to highlight that as we visualize what does this look like, um, this was a model that back in 2006 
while working at ING Direct, um, a few of us put together, and we actually built a lot of the tooling around this to enable these automated quality gates. And across the top, you can see that we had you know, developer's desktop, then we had three different uh, virtual environments that your code would automatically move through, ultimately getting into physical environments of a pre-prod and production. Uh, you can see each one of these areas here and some of the key uh, capabilities that we built into that. And then to help with those quality gates, what were the factors that we built in? And again, all of this being fully automated to get us out to production. So again, this is, um, you can see page 40 is a book that I had the opportunity to co-author with Shane Evans. Um, if you wanna learn some more information, the details are down here. In the left of the slide, these links will work in the PDF that will be distributed. So again, just wanted to highlight that, because I think as we think about how do we visualize this and speak to a variety of different customers, again, it's gonna be your CIO, your CTO, head of application development, maybe some of your different performance, security, functional. Again, all of these bits are built into here and then ultimately laying that automation on top of it. So as we kind of transition into a demo, and this is something that I'm extremely excited to share, um, it's something that while I was interviewing with a number of different companies, including Splunk, when I heard about Splunk and all the capabilities they had, I was like, man, there is a huge opportunity here. So that's what I wanted to show for you today. This is not a Splunk sales pitch, but as you can see, this is a huge problem that I think a number of people are trying to figure out and understand and solve for. So this demo, again, I will walk you through this development pipeline, going through and looking at various CICD elements. Um, how is it that we automatically kick off this validation of performance, security, and functionality? Those being those tests, again, very quick regression. Um, what I'm gonna show you is specifically um, an integration that Henrik and I worked together on for NeoLoad, and that's focusing solely on the performance piece. We also will call Jenkins to go ahead and kick off that build, and you'll see that runs in a few minutes. Um, that data then being automatically captured and pushed into a metrics and events pipeline, then showing that visibility, actions, and automation across all of operations, IT, security, and more. Um, so with that, you can see below, these are some of the bits that we will be showing. Um, and again, starting with Neotis and Neoload, going into showing Jenkins, how we kick that runoff, showing a little bit on Splunk Enterprise, Signal Effects, APM, as well as then the results in Splunk Enterprise, the Signal Effects infrastructure capability, a little bit on Victor Ops, Phantom, and then ultimately um, Splunk in ITSI. So let me go ahead and flip over to that. All right, so you should be seeing my screen now with the video. Yes, we do. Excellent. All right, so this is the problem we were just looking at, CICD pipeline on the top, metrics events pipeline on the bottom, and all the details there. We're gonna start with NeoLoad. Um, what you'll go ahead and see is I'm just gonna show the UI, some of the graphical pieces, how this is typically used. Um, and again, you can see these are the test results that we're looking at. Um, all of these you're probably used to looking at. Um, but again, this is the typical UI. You can go through and you can see all the details. Um, so once these scripts are written and ready to go, um, the build executes through the CI CD process. We then kick this off automatically on the back end as a call through your build life. Um, so again, you can see we're kicking off this build. I've gone ahead and fast forwarded this fairly quickly. So what you'll see is this is gonna move left to right. And as it's doing so, you can see all the steps that we're going through. Um, right now we're, you can see the previous builds have run in about seven minutes. So the idea is this should be a very, very fast run and get you to results. Now we're coming into Splunk Enterprise, we're running our query. You can see that we have 42 different metrics names and those were the different metrics names that you could see. But again, 42 of them total preloaded. Now this is signal effects. You can see here, this is the specific part around our um, APM solution. And again, this is looking at a service um, and the, you can see where it's red and these APIs, um, where the issues are. Um, you can also see a few different things like error rates, 
uh, requests per second and the milliseconds in the response time. Um, you can also see that as you click on it, we have more information as we now move into a dashboard for that specific service. You can see this visualizes much in a, in a much nicer way um, and something that a variety of folks might want to consume. But again, this being that UI for signal effects and the overall APM uh, capability that you can see. As this will go ahead and scroll down a little bit, you're gonna see that there's more information available uh, because again, most, most of us today are running things in Docker, we're running things in Kubernetes. Um, so what if you can have all of those host metrics available to you, again, straight out of a tool, uh, signal effects, um, but brings this unique capability automatically integrated into um, a way to easily bring all of that data in. So again, as we scroll down, you can see the Kubernetes pod metrics as well, um, also visually available to you. Um, now, again, all of this data is being collected, another data collector, and we want to go ahead and be able to bring that all into one consolidated um, location. So as we do that, um, we will see um, some of the Splunk Enterprise results, just like we did for Neolode, uh, where we're gonna bring that in here momentarily. Um, you can see that there's also integrated capabilities um, within this. Um, so if you wanted to click in for more details, it's very easy to do so. Now we're looking at that specific API. We now can see here are the two areas that are of concern for that one service. Uh, you can see that checkout is where we're identifying the majority of the issues and um, why that would vary. So if we come back into Splunk Enterprise, we're now able to see the results for signal effects and we can see it for that Kubernetes container um, specifically. Again, all of this data automatically getting populated in from that collector now into one centralized location to make it easy um, for you to see end to end along with all of these varieties of data sets along the way. Next, we're gonna see a little bit on signal effects um, infrastructure. Um, and this capability will look at, again, that underlying infrastructure, thinking about multi-cloud scenarios. You know, how is it that we can then take that data as another collector point and be able to bring that in? So as we look at signal effects infrastructure, you can see this is across a very large AWS installation. And um, I'm sorry, this looks like Azure right now. Um, but as we look at this, you can see we're trying to zoom in to specific um, zones. Um, this is an east zone that we're looking at. Um, you can also see specific hosts and the ones that have issues based on the color. Again, by easily clicking on that, you're able to see some of the specific system metrics. Again, this visual looks just like what you're used to seeing in signal effects, as well as a number of other um, similar capabilities. Um, now we wanna back up and have a look at how many active hosts do we have? What's the average CPU? Um, all of this is configurable, but out of the box, this is what you get. Um, just by doing a very simple installation. And now as we transition into Victor Ops, um, this is how is it you take all of this data when there becomes an issue and being able to manage that together as a collaborative team. Uh, you can see the timelines here. We can see incidents as they're happening. We can also see the correlation, um, the integration into Slack. Uh, we can go ahead and try to recreate the issues. We can assign the issues, we can resolve the issues all within this collaborative team environment, um, also being able to page out to teams. But again, this being a very highly managed and integrated interface, this is the integration with ServiceNow that you're seeing. Lastly, um, in this quick demo is uh, Phantom as another capability. Um, and this is really that automated orchestration piece. This is a run book uh, automation um, that we're showing how it can run some of the key timelines and activities. Um, you'll also see that there's a heads up display to kind of give you a quick summary of everything that's going on in the environment. Lastly, within ITSI, this is Splunk IT Service Insights. In here, we're gonna quickly see all the variety of services that are out there and running, this being the top 50. Below, you can see there's a top 50 KPIs that we could also look at. Um, we'll be looking also at a service tree. You can see this lights up with the green, amber, red, and there's also an orange color in there for you. As you click on this, you can see this opens up into what's called a deep dive. There you can see the different KPIs. You can also see how that relates to the critical and high episodes that are happening. 
Um, with that, we can also click into the specific entities that are having issues. And again, we can see a variety of SQL servers here and very quickly see that entity um, with a severity level assigned. Again, that's all happening behind the scenes. Um, as we dive into the specific episode, we're now able to see the severity of these incidents, how they're being managed. There's now 108 counts of the events that are happening within this on-prem um, database service. Um, one could then say, well, I want to go ahead and do a little bit more of a deep dive into that and look around and see what's happening specific to that on-prem database service. Um, but you can see it's very easy to sort, filter, roll through everything that's going on across all of your environments, all from one single source. Um, as we keep moving through, you can create a Victor's Ops incident from this interface. That'll go ahead and create it again. Um, so that, yep, we're looking, we're seeing what the issue is. You can see we're paging out and the integration with ServiceNow, if that's what you're using. Now we can go into analyze this deep dive on the left-hand side. These are a variety of the services that we have already seen that are available. And as we scroll left to right here, what you're going to see is how that data has already been correlated against the time series to show everything that's going on across all of these services Underneath those services are the KPIs that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. And if you wanted to see the very specific detail of what's happening in the logs, or in this example, this is a Windows events that they're happening as they're happening, all of that's available by clicking on the service on the left-hand side um, to provide you with that detailed level across, again, all of the variety of collectors that are out there that you may be using. So we come back to the problem. Hopefully this makes sense. You can understand why in our typical CI CD pipelines, all the metrics and events that are happening. And again, from this demo, moving through that CI CD pipeline, kicking off that validation. For this one, we showed Neo load and performance, as well as uh, data automatically being captured and through those metrics. So I'm going to stay sharing here, Henrik, and I will go to my slides again. So the last little piece here showing that able to leverage Phantom for your automated run books um, and then being able to just sit back and watch those notifications happen. Um, so I mentioned kind of going back to journey. Um, so many of you are on a journey. Um, this is not meant to be any type of maturity model but it's something that I have found helpful um, in putting together and having conversations with a variety of folks. As we start on the left, we've got stage one, data to everything platform. Then as we move to stage two, we're really thinking about all of those real-time monitoring metrics, observability, everything else that's listed in here. Um, I know that uh, Andy had mentioned a lot of the open source capabilities. Again, open tracing, distributed tracing, all of that being in stage two. As we get into stage three, um, that's where you start thinking about this collaborative incident management. How do we better prevent and resolve incidents? This is a major area of focus for many of your organizations today. And lastly, where I think the big value comes out is in stage four. So being able to leverage all of that data, all of the information, all of the results to get to that automated orchestration and response, both for a security perspective and also from an IT perspective. So with that, I'm going to kind of transition into, you know, a little bit of about Splunk. But again, my passion is really in enabling people to learn and sharing. So Conf 20 is coming up very soon. You can see 20th through the 22nd of October, depending on your region. Um, this is absolutely free. It's going to be a phenomenal event. We've got about 200 different presentations. Each one of them is roughly 30 minutes uh, to keep it nice and short because we're all going to be remote. Um, but again, very, very fun um, sessions, uh, a lot of entertainment throughout. I highly encourage you to go out and sign up right now, conf.splunk.com. Um, there's a session I did want to call your attention to. Had a lot of fun with this. So was able to pull in um, James Laspada from Capital One, as well as Chase Holderman from Wells Fargo. And we talked about these five new Splunk features every DevOps and SRE needs to incorporate in 2021. This was a 30-minute feed round of a practitioner's view from a DevOps and SRE perspective. So again, talking about capabilities, challenges, opportunities, and what we have as priorities for 2021. 
Um, lastly, I wanted to include some of the useful links of all the things that I've mentioned. So again, this will be available in the PDF for distribution. Um, you can see the five with the links at the top. Um, free Splunk, this is everything I'm trying to get out to people. We've done some really cool stuff on the COVID-19 side as well with an app, the data being um, updated every single day and available to you to visualize however you might want to. And then there's a bunch of free Splunk education. Um, again, this is something that I leverage in a number of different ways, whether it's my children or as an adjunct professor, you know, big data is something that's here. It's on all of our minds and trying to figure out the best way to leverage it. So we just want to get that information out to you. Lastly, you'll see that I've got a Splunk local user group. Click there, join it. Um, we're doing bi-weekly sessions right now, and it's pretty fun. Um, so again, that's everything that I have prepared, Henrik, and um, would love to go ahead and take any questions. Um, you can see my Twitter and LinkedIn below also. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Todd. So I'm going to enable the uh, other webcams of the other uh, PAC members that are connected. So Joey, uh, let's, let's figure out if Joey's connected, but I will start with Oscar and uh, uh, I, a Christian that will be uh, the two uh, co-speakers of the next session. Um, Alejandro, will we try again to enable his webcam? I don't know if he's, uh, he's available because he's probably going to have some work delivered. Um, so I'm going to that there is some background noise here. All right, so let's start the Q&A session. Uh, so uh, um, first of all, there is uh, one question that has been asked in the Q&A session. So let's start with this one. It's a question uh, that has been asked from our friend Andres Suarez. So how, how is it possible to identify from early stage the degradation or behavior during a, a CI that affect the digital experience of an end user? So I guess, I mean, this has been a topic that I think we've all long spoken about. Um, the way that I've been able to do it and other people have been able to do it is, um, again, pulling these metrics out of your lower environments first. Um, I, I actually had a CTO at in the last organization I worked at um, who was in one of the largest businesses that we had. And, and she forcefully said, you need to start in all of my lower environments first with your instrumentation and providing that data. So, again, I think getting started and looking at that early stage, um, you know, how is it that you're leveraging these different types of collectors in those lower environments? And again, we talk about affecting the digital experience of the end user. There's a lot in there that we could look at and know that, you know, in prior sessions, you know, Zach Cole, Mark Tomlinson, we've all talked about different things highly around the network. Um, so latency, packet loss, jitter, bandwidth, these being the four major factors. Um, so again, I don't know if those are some of the digital experience concerns of that end user um, that you would want to think about. Um, and again, I see the question has IC, but I guess we'll talk about continuous integration. Hen Henrik, maybe that's what um, Andre's meant here. Um, so again, as I think about that continuous integration, um, as we had shown, being able to call into Jenkins to kick off that quick run that only took seven minutes to execute. Um, again, this was a CIO at um, ING Direct who we were in the middle of a production deployment and he looked over at me at about three o'clock a.m. Eastern time and said, uh, you know, hey Todd, the, the one that we're pushing into production is having issues. Is the one that we have in our late pre-prod stage better or worse than what we have in production? And that was 2006. So again, one of the reasons that Having built this capability in many different places I've been and something I like to share, point straight to that question. I was not able to answer it with any types of metrics or specific details to show in 2006. Hey, here's why the next release or build that we have that's coming through the late stage pre-prod is better than the one that we're having all these issues with deploying in the prod, but I would have loved to. And uh, again, that's an uncomfortable conversation to have with your CIO if you do not have that data. So again, I guess, Andres, there's a long answer to your simple question. Um, there's another question from Andres, but uh, he's, uh, I think he's, he's being interesting to compare Splunk with Dynatrace. So I think it's like more signal ethics compared to Dynatrace, I guess, because you have different product at Splunk. So uh, some products will, 
uh, we'll do more of the IT, uh, ATSM stuff. But here it's going to be SignalFX that will be more a competitor of Dynatrace. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. And one of the things that as I was interviewing with a variety of different companies and I started to learn about the capabilities of Splunk, um, you know, historically everybody's thought of Splunk, Splunk as, you know, log aggregation, reporting, creating some dashboards, things like that. Um, my eyes were really opened, um, Andres, when, you know, I started to see the capabilities of SignalFX, APM, SignalFX, infrastructure, VictorOps, Phantom, how all that gets pulled in together with Splunk ITSI. So, again, it is that full end-to-end -end capability. Um, one could, you know, argue that, um, you know, with the SignalFX APM solution as well as the SignalFX infrastructure capability, um, maybe some other things that will be announced coming up at .conf20. Um, you know, it is going to be a very competitive marketplace. Cool. Um, and a question to you, because I know that uh, Blank has a lot of APIs, and I know, as uh, uh, we discussed in the previous uh, uh, region of the park with the or Ozoris, all the notion of uh, quality gates, and yeah. especially um, the uh, SLI provider of Captain. So yeah. uh, I think that uh, because of the nature of uh, the, the power of uh, Splunk to index and uh, get a lot of data, uh, you could be a, a pretty good candidate to uh, be a uh, to be an SLI provider for Captain. So um, you. <laughs> So this is what I, I was thinking. So hey, it's an open source framework. Why don't you? What where is not uh, any uh, Splunk provider, Splunk's SLI provider in the Captain community? That's an interesting idea. I just knowing kind of the the pipeline. I don't know, um, but that would be a really good conversation to have and dig into a little bit more. Um, I do know with a lot of the built-in capabilities already within Splunk, especially as we think about, again, all of these different data collectors that you have there out there, how do you bring that in? How do you correlate it, aggregate it with machine learning, AI, predictive analytics, all of that that are already built into these core capabilities within Splunk? So, you know, I know we've, we've talked a lot about um, a variety of tools already through this pack. Um, but again, what if that was already built into your existing solutions and you could just focus on the results and the automated orchestration? Um, but again, that kind of four-step journey that, that we talked through very quickly, you know, what if all that was already there for you and you could just focus on results of your customer? Um, would that change the conversation? I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But I, I like the, the scoring approach that, that makes your, your pipeline uh, more, more efficient. Mm -hmm. Captain, at the moment, is a, is a cool, cool feature that delivers that, 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 uh, that, that feature. So that, that's what I ask. Awesome. Um, so, Christian uh, and uh, Oscar, how are you? Cool. Thanks for coming. Hi, you? <laughs> Doing good, thanks. Still up? Still, still awake. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you have any questions for for Todd? Um, no, be, be, because um, it's the it's the same question with Andres, and he are, uh, answered the this question. 